Thank you, for Professor Basu, for a very interesting and insightful lecture. I, I have perhaps two questions. Going back to the first goal that you explained very clearly in the earlier part of your presentation, talking about targeting a 3% poverty rate globally. And one of the assumptions is that the world, if, if the world continues to grow at the rate like what it did from 2000 to 2010, and you mentioned that that was a period when the developing world was growing very fast. And even if you continue to grow at that rate for the next 20 years, the global poverty rate will not hit 3%. And therefore, we have a lot to do. But then I think that the, the big question is, could the world continue to grow so fast for the next 20 years? Given all the concerns right now we have, oh, it's not only global warming and you know, sorry, climate, climatic changes and, and resource sustainability issues, as well as political and social sustainability issues and so on. That is, that is the first question. The second related question is that the world as a whole is aging. And 30, 20 years from now, you will have a lot more old people in many parts of the world. And therefore, the bottom 40% of the population, the nature of poverty in the bottom 40% of, uh, of the people will, will actually gradually change. And how, 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 how do you f factor this aging issue into your, your targets and what sort of policies have you in mind? Yeah. On the first part, actually, we have been doing some thinking. On the second one, we are aware of, but done very little. But let me get to this a little bit more. The growth, um, even with the growth, high growth, which we achieved between uh, 20 uh, and 2010, I was arguing that we will not reach uh, the target. But what Mr. Kwok is pointing out, that is this high growth even possible? Or will we do even worse than that? And I feel there is a very, very clear risk that we will not uh, do that high growth from here on. Again, we are talking about the future. There can be some magical invention which will change things, but it is unlikely. One is a large part of the high growth over the last 10 years, 20 years, 30 years that we've seen, especially because the population is so large in China, is driven by China's high growth. And, the chi and China's high growth was a phenomenal high growth of around 10% per annum over a stretch of time. Will this continue? India has hit now above 9% growth for a couple of years. It's down again right now, but it has been doing about 8% for a while. But again, it's a big population. If India can keep up a 7% growth or so in the near future, that will be something, but we don't know whether that's possible. What you are suggesting, and I am a bit concerned, that Malthus used to be worried about can our productivity keep up? But Malthus is, uh, that straight Malthusian explanation is not right, but it is coming back through a back door, which is the environment. If all our consumption increases, at, let us do an, a, a mental exercise that China's consumption reaches United States consumption very rapidly. Given China's population size, that's going to create a huge demand on the environment. And China is not just one country. I mean, there are other big countries. India is close to China's population. India's population will probably overtake China's population. There are African countries where growth rate of population is much faster than China or India. Nigeria is growing now just at a trouncing rate. So these will be populous segments. All of them trying to reach that standard is going to put huge strains on the environment. Hopefully, and there's a lot of awareness of this, we are going to play into newer policies which will be environmentally sustainable. But that will put some dampener on growth. So on this, my expectation is we are not going to grow at the rate at which we grew over the last 10 years or 15 years. It will probably be a slower growth. Some of this growth, luckily, is beginning to take place in parts of the world where the growth is needed. Today, one of the best growing areas is sub-Saharan Africa which is growing at an average rate of 4.8% per annum. That is very desirable. That's a very poor area. You want the growth to take place. But overall, we will probably have to be reconciled to a slower growth. To that extent, policies which are redistributive in a certain way will play an important role. And we have to go into the design question. I gave you one or two examples of designs, but there are a thousand different thoughts to be brought to the table. Your second one. 
frankly, we haven't done much work. The first one on the growth and its interface with poverty, we are doing a lot of work in the bank. The second one we are aware of. In fact, there are countries where this problem is already becoming acute. South Korea is a very good example, where the a disproportionate number of poor people are the older people. So the population is aging rapidly, and a lot of this, the poorest people are the older people if you're not putting together a system to look after them well enough. A country like China did see a demographic dividend. India is right now on the slopes of demographic dividend. The younger age group population is increasing, so India's average age is falling right now. Africa, the demographic dividend is just about starting out. So Africa still has a distance to go. But all the rich countries, including a lot of middle-income countries, that is past. The old age population is rising, and it will continue to rise. At times when I think about this, it's not very clear to me what's going to happen to the world when a disproportionate number of people are old. There are two things. One is, of course, if there are, again, very important breakthroughs in healthcare, so that people remain active uh, till the age of 80, let us say, completely productive, which is not impossible. There is medical advances taking place. That will be a very changed landscape where, yes, the old population is very large, but people are working and participating in Olympics till the age of 80. I hope that happens soon so I can benefit from these medical uh, uh, takeoffs in the next uh, one or two decades. But it's possible. But the more likely is to extrapolate from here onwards the way it has gone, which makes us believe that there will be a large population that will be relatively dependent on a smaller working age population. I do believe that this will create strains of the kind that we are seeing right now in South Korea, to a certain extent in Japan. And you will begin to see this in China one day, in India one day it's going to come. We are not ready for it. All I can say is that I'm, I'm glad you bring this question. I think we need to collectively think very hard about what to do, because this is not a problem which is going to come in the next year or the next five years, but it is a problem that could come to the world in the next 20 years, and we'd better be prepared for that. Uh, Professor Basu, uh, Chen Lin from Hong Kong U. So uh, thanks for the very insightful sharing. And I, I understand your point about this uh, kind of a race to the bottom incentive uh, for this country to adopt a very, very low tax rate to attract you know, capitals and skills. Uh, my, my question just will be like, we know that uh, in, nowadays it's not only for tax, but also for kind of financial regulations. So that country try to use um, have more coordinate, coordinations uh, in their financial regulatory frameworks and to prevent the kind of regulatory arbitrage activities. Uh, but it, do, in, in, pragmatically, in, 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 in terms of the tax policy or fiscal policy, is it possible for the, for the countries to coordinate on this? Uh, and uh, just using the, using the case you gave, like you know, a, a poor kid compared to a rich kid, you know, so the developing countries are just more like poor kids, right? You know, so uh, is it fair for them to use a similar kind of a, a tax policy uh, as those uh, developed countries? You know, because these countries, they, you know, inev inevitably they need more capital and for their development. So that's just my question on it. Yeah. You know, there is, um this um, problem of within country and across countries. Um, uh, we can't, of course, have the same policies that a rich country follows and a poor country follows, or a, even a developing middle-income country follows and a rich country follows, because the resources are very, very different in the hands of the two. You know, there's a recent study uh, which showed uh, the wealth concentration difference, I don't know if you saw that, uh, which shows that the 85 wealthiest people on earth own the same amount of wealth as the bottom half of the entire world population. So the richest 85 people have the same wealth as the bottom half of the world. So huge disparities over there. And it is true that the bulk of this is in the richer countries that's there. There are two sets of things you have to think of. One is a country-specific policy within a country as to what you do, and I agree there's going to be country differences. But there is also something which is not going to happen in a hurry. You need some inter-country policies as well. And you have to think in terms of certain kinds of transfers, even small amounts, from rich to poor countries. 
Piketty makes that point. At this point of time, it does appear somewhat idealistic that that will happen. And of course, each country will guard. But human beings have moved beyond their complete narrow self-interest to certain kinds of coordinations of policies. You mentioned financial regulation. We do, after all, today, in today's world, try to do some commonness of policies across countries. In world trade, thanks to WTO, we try to have some common policies across the world, which earlier seemed impossible. Even things like nuclear weaponry, at one stage, it would have appeared that it would be impossible to have a collective policy in the world because each country has such a well-defined self-interest. But we do know that we can, despite that, have the self-interest, but also at least make a small room to rise above that to have some collective policy. So it's a very challenging area, global inequality, but it's something that we should think about and think in terms of policy. It's happened in other areas. Next question, please. At the back. Yeah, at the Okay, um, uh, I'm Brian Chen from HQST. Uh, thank you, Dr. Basu, for that very insightful talk. Uh, just then you mentioned about the rationality of the food program in India, and that piqued my interest. You said that um, humans aren't like robots, they're ration rational. But then, like many people are discussing nowadays, like the process of machina machination, where we switch from humans to letting machines do the work. So how do you think this affect such the design of such programs and on that note how does the world bank predict and take note of current technological trends to see how they will affect the um, societal spectrum in the future thank you uh, two points oh i'm sorry is it causing a problem my moving no, no, no. shifting back and forth yeah. okay uh, two points two points related to what you're saying um, the World Bank is actually very much into this particular topic. We have just declared recently that the next World Development Report, every year the World Bank brings out, brings out a World Development Report, the next one, the one which will come out in the year 2015, is going to be on the internet and development, the role of the internet in development. And a lot of this is basically to make the many of these kinds of services much more machine driven and mechanical so that the human factor goes down and what you deserve you can get because hopefully at least in initially robots will not learn to cheat the system they will do what they are supposed to do so the system should prob uh, work so yes we are beginning to do work on that and uh, i agree that bringing technology in you can solve a lot of this problem but the one more thing i wanted to stress you're not asking that when i say that human beings are not robotic, they will try to make profits and benefit themselves. I also want to remind ourselves that at times economists overdo this assumption that human beings are completely selfish. Wherever there is scope for profit, they try to make a profit, which is not true. Human beings have morals, human beings have altruism, and life would not be possible if we didn't have those traits. Take a very simple example. Why don't we, when we go in a bus, uh, pinch the wallet from other people's pockets? When I ask my very traditional economist friends, the reason they give me is that we, the reason why we don't steal other people's wallet is because the benefit from that and the cost from that, the cost is you might be caught and beaten up. That does not square up. That's why we don't steal. Now, I don't buy that. I don't think when we get into a bus, we do calculations about whether to steal other people's wallet or not. I, mean, I would be very nervous traveling in a bus if I thought everyone is calculating whether it's worth stealing my wallet. This is a myth that the economics profession has spread. Human beings also have lots of va programmed values. I just don't steal another person's wallet. It's a part of my human nature. And these natures can differ from society to society and over time. And a big responsibility is not just to make the system incentive compatible, but also to drive and train people that there are certain things you're just not supposed to do. If the government is giving you food to distribute to a poor household, you don't sell that food on the market. So I also don't want to say that you just don't sit back and say human beings will always do that. Societies do become very different. And one important thing to remember 
is these differences that we see across societies. For instance, if you were running this program in Japan, the food system, or in the Scandinavian countries, even if there was a lot of profit to be made, it probably would not, because people are programmed that I, I wouldn't cheat, this is the system I'm supposed to follow. So people do get programmed. The important thing also to worth remembering is human beings are fundamentally very similar. A person from China, a person from India, a person from Africa, United States, fundamentally we are very similar. Over time, through our history, through experience, we become different. Some of our norms become different. But given that our fundamentals are very similar, it is possible to develop norms which are more societally friendly norms. So again, we economists play too little re respect and space for that. And I also was being an economist when I was telling you that it's all to do with rationality and individual strife for that. But we must not forget that there is a normative side to us which ought to be nurtured and developed. Next question, please. Yeah. Um, the gentleman in the gray suit. Thank you very much, Professor Basu. I'm the Bunker Aaron, Consul from Consulate General of India, Hong Kong. Uh, my, I have two uh, comments to make. One uh, seeks to improve my understanding of this uh, excellent uh, chart that you've shown on policy making uh, between tax rate uh, policies and globalization in terms of uh, improving income inequality. Now, the measure you've put in the matrix is, is basically an index, a number from varying from three to one or half, which uh, quantifies the disparity or the, the optimum uh, welfare uh, level in the, in the previous chart that you had shown by way of uh, the income of the lower group and the higher group. So am I right in my understanding that this is a quantum a measure which, which signifies a kind of maximization of the, 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 the bottom 40 as well as the top? In this figure though, the, each number does not distinguish between the bottom and the top. It's some sort and of consolidated. It's an index of a consolidated, consolidated measure, yeah. which basically yeah. uh, ensures there is uh, optimum equality or minimum inequality. Right. So, um, uh, uh, fa fair enough. So, you, you, uh, the second point yeah. comes from this, yeah. that uh, uh, there is a need for coordination in tax policies, uh, among other things, between different countries. And there are organizations like OECD you mentioned, and also the World Customs Organization, uh, wherein uh, uh, we feel there is a lot of scope for synergies in policy making, you know, uh, even when it comes to supply chain security uh, of goods movement from one part of the globe to another. Uh, harmonious working of customs administrations can play a tremendous role in cutting down barriers. So, uh, is there a, a, a sort of a thought or a plan of action on part of World Bank to, to address and highlight this concern before these, these bodies? And if so, I would be grateful to, to know about the same. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. You know, um, the World Bank does not have anything definite on the plate for this kind of coordination, but thanks to these new goals and new analysis, we are aware of the inter-country dimension of the problem. So while for certain kinds of policies there are already bodies taken care of, as I was mentioning, on trade policy the World Bank has nothing to do because WTO is doing that, trying to do the coordination. But for certain kinds of taxation policy and fiscal policy, no one is doing it. I had raised this also earlier in G20 fora to see if G20 could coordinate there was some discussion when I used to represent India on the map process in G20. I had brought it up several times. But G20, we talked about this, it never picked up. I'm very keen in the World Bank to get the World Bank into this. So actually, if you have more detailed suggestions, this model is, of course, very artificially constructed just to get the issues on the table and to show that there is an inter-country problem. But if you can bring to me some specific ideas, I would love to take it on board because all we have done till now is written down our two goals, track the global situation on that, we are collecting data, etc. On policy, we are only now beginning to work, so we are, these are the kinds of things that we will take up. Yeah, thank you. Next question. Mm. Yeah, this one in the front. Hello. Hello, Professor Basu. I'm a Hong Kong undergraduate student and also a research assistant of Professor Tao. Um, I'm curious about um, the consideration of the World Bank when it is allocating its resources. Uh, you have referred to two goals. First is $1.25 uh, per day line and another is 40% uh, bottom. And uh, even when you target those person, you should have priorities among them because 
uh, for example, if the World Bank has a pool of funds, you should decide to uh, lend more to whom and uh, lend uh, to whom earlier. And uh, with the capacity constraint, um, I'm considering if you are, uh, as economists, you will maybe lend more to the poor countries because they maybe have a higher marginal utility if we do care about uh, total utilities. And also, you may also consider that those poor countries has a uh, worse uh, economic system, so you will have lower marginal return f from investing in these countries. This is some kind of trade-off. So I'm uh, considering whether the World Bank has a model or have, what's the considerations of the World Bank when the World Bank is allocating to resources. Thanks. You know, um, this is uh, something that we have talked about, this particular trade-off. On this, the World Bank does not have a very clear uh, uh, criterion, but we are aware of this trade-off. This, by the way, in Indian planning, this has been discussed a lot. India has something called the Finance Commission, which considers redistribution of money from the center to the different states in India. And exactly this dilemma that you're pointing out comes up very explicitly. There are some very poor regions where the need is greater, but you know that money sent to those regions will not be used well enough. So the need is greater, but a lot of the money is going to go waste. Whereas there's another region where the need is less because the region is better off, but it's much more effective in using the money. So each dollar, is, each rupee will be used better, and you'll get more bang for the buck. That's what you're pointing to, right? This for the World Bank is an even bigger problem than for India because India is looking at the Indian states where there is disparity, but disparity that much. Whereas for the World Bank, the disparity is huge across the whole world. There are some parts of the world where you know money sent there is going to go down the drain completely because there is just not a governance system to use that. This is a huge dilemma. What do you do? Do you ignore those countries or not? At times when you know that a country is being led by people, who are completely corrupt. So when you try to get money to that country, to the ordinary people in that country, it's going to be intercepted and the money will go. There are some cases where you have to stop lending, even though you know the need is huge. But the governance problem is so large that each dollar sent from the World Bank will have no effect. You then don't send money there. It's unfortunate, but World Bank is not able to put together the political system that will allow that to happen. Where that does not happen, we try to reach out to the poorest where the need is greatest. But there is the caveat that, as you said, it's a constrained maximization we are doing because the budget is limited. We are indeed forced in certain areas to stop lending just because it's impossible. We are not being able to get where the money uh, needs to go. Either there is a huge amount of pilferage of the money at the top, or there is so much environmental damage that we believe in the long run it's going to not get any benefit, though the region is poor. But barring that constraint where, where that hits us, the World Bank policy is that you reach the, try to reach the poorest nations with maximum support. And it's no surprise that today the biggest operations of the World Bank takes place in sub-Saharan Africa. That's the biggest. The second largest is in South Asia, where there's also a lot of poverty, but the biggest is in sub-Saharan Africa. Next question, please. Uh, thank you, Professor Basu, for this very insightful and thought-provoking talk. Uh, I am quite interested in the several charts that you have put up. Uh, put up. Uh, what, what is in my mind is that, uh, of course, it's quite you know, obvious that if there are certain policy changes, it can promote uh, better equality, uh, either within a country or across country. But uh, what incentives are there uh, that we can, you know, uh, drive towards a better distribution of, uh, say, wealth, both within and across countries. For instance, in one of the chart, it says that if the tax rate is zero, then the rich will keep everything. But what, uh, what, what are the incentives that you can, you know, convince the rich to give something to the poor by, you know, uh, agreeing to a certain change in tax policy or Similarly, you know, between countries, especially, um, of course, you know, in Piketty's uh, argument, he says that, you know, if we allow all this discontent to grow, then perhaps at the end of the day, 
we may have to resolve this by very drastic measures such as war uh, between countries. Yeah. But before we come to that drastic stage, how can we convey the message so that the stakeholders are willing to change? Yeah. You know, um, there is, of course, the last thing that you said is true. There is one self-interest for the rich to reach out to the poor, which is to do with the fact that if the world continues to drift in the direction, the number I gave you, 85 uh, individuals having the wealth of half the world population, if that becomes even smaller, there's going to be political turmoil of a kind which will not be in the interest of the rich. So you can appeal to the interest of the rich, but that's not good enough. I feel there is also, there is something called humanity, which we can appeal to and must appeal to. And what at one stage appears impossible can change. We've seen changes in ideas and practices and human behavior of a kind that at one stage may have seemed impossible. Take apartheid in South Africa. Total discrimination against people of one race. That mindset finally changed. It was partly pressure, partly lots of whites also felt there's something morally wrong. Just because we've got the initial advantage for us to keep that advantage through this is wrong. In India, there used to be the caste practices for actually a thousand years. Dreadful caste practices, a lot of that is still there. But it's gone down vastly. And once again, it is the ordinary people, even the upper caste, many of them realizing that there's something dreadfully wrong. It is not a fundamental part of our thinking. I mean, after all, there has been race in America was a huge factor in race with discrimination, open discrimination, till even 50 years ago in the United States. But that mindset has changed. So I believe we also have to work on the mindset of the rich. That it is not a right that has dropped from the heaven or something like that for this. And to say each time that it is hard work that has got me here. Yes, hard work is important. And I can see that a certain amount of inequality will be there in life. For the economies to be efficient, you will have a certain amount of inequality. But the level of inequality you have today is far too much. And a lot of it is inequality at birth, huge amount. You're born poor, you're born rich. There's little justification for that. One simple calculation which I myself had done a couple of years ago, if you take the income of the 10 richest people in the world, that's the same as the income of the entire population of Ethiopia, which is about 90 million people. So 10 richest people in the world have an annual income same as the annual income of the entire population of Ethiopia. And Ethiopia has some rich people. So if you take the bottom 90% of Ethiopia, you can see the gap between the 10 richest people in the world and the bottom 90%. Fortunately, you will find among some of the richest people in the world, and this gives me hope, who will point out that given the system that has been created, we've done well, we had the ability, we've done well, but we feel it is wrong. You'll find voices now saying that we have to correct this. And some of these voices come from very rich people, saying that you have to change some of these rules of the game. Some inequality will remain, but this huge inequality will go. So yes, you can appeal to their self-interest in terms of that there can be violence, there can be wars caused by this huge disparity, but there is also something beyond that, and it is there in us to recognize that there is humanity. And you know, many of the activists on the ground who have done good work over time, from religious activists to social activists, have pointed to this fact that human beings have in them the ability to reach beyond their own self-interest. And I leave some hope with that. Where people believe that you are rewarded by your effort. Uh, as a result, you know, and, and, and then we have, there, there are also, you know, arguments about uh, um, tax can be, can, has, uh, can have the negative impact on incentive to work, especially incentive to work hard. So uh, how are we going to, you know, strike a balance here? And does it mean that um, what we, or what I used to believe in the, in the efficiency of the market system is, it's, uh, uh, that is, we need to adjust this thinking. Or is there anything that, that is uh, desirable uh, that we can add to, to make this ma market system working better? Yeah. You know, um, uh, you get a sense of 
the drive for the market system, material drive. I remember one year I was in, Be not Hong Kong, but I was in Beijing for one week, in New Delhi for one week. And in both these cities, I was just meeting people who were talking about drive for more wealth, more development, more growth, etc. Then I went to New York and I was giving a lecture and I said that I've been spending two weeks, one week in Beijing, one week in Delhi, only talking about money and growth. I now want to get away from this extreme materialism. And saying that in New York, I didn't realize it caused some laughter in the audience, taking New York as the escape from that. But it is true that some of the greatest drive now, you will see Hong Kong is already a well-off, uh, a re very well-off region, but you'll see this in when you go into emerging uh, economies, the drive is very big. And the market, I want to clarify, that I am not giving a very traditional um, um, uh, prescription. Many people who address this problem of inequality are very dismissive of the market. That you cannot be. So there has to be a lot of imaginative thinking. The market is a very powerful machine. You can't do without that. So you have to allow the market to function, the market to flourish. But while the market is functioning and flourishing, you have to intelligently tackle it, adjust parts of it, so that the better distribution comes out of that mechanism. So the market must not be thwarted. One big mistake that has happened in many countries is all the good intention for better distribution reaching to the poor took the form of cramping the market altogether, bringing the state with a heavy hand, destroying the market. So I'm not giving that advice at all. The market has a very big role to play. But there are two things. The market needs to be tampered with. The state has to come in, use the power of the market, not destroy the market, use the power of the market, do some redistribution. But there is also the other thing which I just mentioned. Ordinary people have a side in them, a humanity side coming from humanity, that they are aware of these differences across societies. We have to play on that human emotion as well, so that even the rich realize that I have a personal responsibility for the poor, and we have to collectively mend the system so that these huge disparities which have cropped up in the world today gets corrected. I think it's possible. Now, on my full book that was mentioned in the beginning, Beyond the Invisible Hand, is virtually a discussion of the role of the market and the role of the state. So I now recommend you read it. <laughs> the last question, please. Yeah, the gentleman at the back. It's, uh, it's Herman, uh, Hong Kong University. Uh, my interest in, in, uh, is in sustainability. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, about the population of China, of India, and the future growth. Uh, in fact, if you add the two countries together, they're probably, about, say, 10 times the size of the US. Uh, you, and you touched on that earlier in one of your answers, um, uh, that um, the, the model of economic growth would probably have to change to take into consideration of that. But I just wondered uh, what the role that the World Bank has, uh, especially in, when you come to defining World Bank's uh, aim, you have the two uh, policy aims. Sh should we take sustainability uh, formally into those goals? Or, uh, um, it's, oh, sorry, yeah, it's a timetable, right, but should we take it formally to, into, those, those, uh, into, into, into the goals? Uh, or, is it, or, it, or maybe it's already too late? What do you think? It's already pretty late. But we still have to take account of that. And there are two ways in which the sustainability goal comes in with our two goals. One is, since both our goals are really long-term goals, so we are not just aiming to bring poverty down to 3% by 2030 and then allowing it to go up once again. We want to hold it there. The bottom 40% of the populations, we want those to grow in a sustained fashion. So a part of the sustainability goal is already a part of these goals, since these are sustainable goals. But over and above that, even if you cannot relate every good policy to these two goals, there are some good policies which should be enforced and you should move towards. That sustainability is one of those. And we have seen that the destruction of the atmosphere can cause problems from a city pollution level to all kinds of long-run damage it can do. So the World Bank is now very, very active in this through our goals, but even otherwise, through a direct initiative on the Climate Fund. And actually, we have created a new vice presidency, a full vice presidency, 
which looks into environmental matters and climate change matters. That formally goes into effect, I think, tomorrow. Uh, um, it, uh, yeah.